50th anniversary edition of Lord of the Rings. With a good J.R. Tolkien signature on the back. When we last left our hobbits, Mary and I. Talk about some, they talked to some elves along the way. Yep, they did talk to some elves. I don't elves know if they mentioned any dogs along the way before. Well, they mentioned them, but not in the last chapter. They were traveling in the darkness towards the Brandywine Bridge, and they heard a horseman coming, and they thought it was going to be a black rider, and then out of the darkness emerged. Mary Doc Brandybuck with his wagon and their farmer friend, Farmer Maggot, went back home. And so we pick up in chapter five, a conspiracy unmasked. Now we had better get home ourselves, said Mary. There's something funny about all of this, I see, but it must wait till we get in. They turned down the ferry lane, which was straight and well kept and edged with large whitewashed stones. In a hundred yards or so, it brought them to the riverbank where there was a broad wooden landing stage. A large flat ferry boat was moored beside it. The white bollards near the water's edge glimmered in the light of two lamps on high posts. Behind them, the mists in the flat fields were now above the hedges, but the water before them was dark with only a few curling wisps like steam among the reeds by the bank. There seemed to be less fog on the further side. Mary led the pony over a gangway onto the ferry, and the others followed. Mary then pushed slowly off with a long pole. The brandy wine flowed slow and broad before them. On the other side, the bank was steep, and up it, a winding path climbed from the further landing. Lamps were twinkling there. Behind loomed up the Buck Hill, and out of it, through stray, shr stray shrouds of mist, that was hard to say, shone many round windows, yellow and red. These were the windows of Brandy Hall, the ancient home of the Brandy Bucks. Long ago, Gorhan Dad Old Buck, head of the Old Buck family, one of the oldest in the Marsh and indeed in the Shire, had crossed the river, which was the original boundary of the land eastwards. He built and excavated Brandy Hall, changed his name to Brandy Buck, and settled down to become master of what was virtually a small independent country. His family grew and grew, and after his, after his days, continued to grow until Brandy Hall occupied the whole of the low hill and had three large front doors, many side doors, and about a hundred windows. The Brandy Bucks and their numerous dependents then began to burrow and later to build all round about. That was the origin of Buckland. Judah. A thickly inhabited strip between the river and the old forest a sort of colony from the Shire. Its chief village was Buckleberry, clustering in the banks of slopes behind the Brandy Hall. The people in the Marsh were friendly with the Bucklanders and the authority of the master of the hall, as the head of the Brandy Buck family was called, was still acknowledged by the farmers between Stock and Rushy. But most of the folk of the old Shire regarded the Bucklanders as peculiar, half foreigners as it were though, as a matter of fact, they were not very different from the other hobbits of the four farthings, except in one point. They were fond of boats, and some of them could swim. Their land was originally unprotected from the east, but on that side they built a hedge, the high hay. It had been planted many generations ago, and it was now thick and tall, for it was constantly tended, and it ran all the way from the Brandywine Bridge in a big loop curving away from the river to Hayes End, where the Withywindle flowed out of the forest into the Brandywine, well over 20 miles from end to end. But of course, it was not a complete protection. The forest drew close to the hedge in many places. The Bucklanders kept their doors locked after dark, and that also was not unusual in the Shire. The ferry boat moved slowly across the water. The Buckland shore drew near. Sam was the only member of the party who had not been over a river before. 
over the river before. He had a strange feeling as the slow gurgling stream slipped by. His old life lay behind in the mist. Dark adventure lay in front. He scratched his head and for a moment had a passing wish that Mr. Frodo could have gone on living quietly at Bag End. The four hobbits stepped off the ferry. Mary was tying it up and Pippin was already leading the pony up the path. When Sam, who had been looking back as if to say farewell to the Shire, said in a hoarse whisper, Look back, Mr. Frodo. Do you see anything? On the far stage, under those distant lamps, they could just make out a figure. It looked like a dark black bundle left behind, but as they looked, it seemed to move and sway this way and that, as if searching the ground, and then it crawled and went on crouching back into the gloom beyond the lamp. What in the Shire is that? exclaimed Mary. Something that is following us, said Frodo. But don't ask any more now. Let's get away at once. They hurried up the path to the top of the bank, but when they looked back, the far shore was shrouded in mist and nothing could be seen. Thank goodness you don't keep any boats on the west bank, said Frodo. Can horses cross this river? They can go 10 miles north to Brandywine Bridge, or they might swim, answered Mary, though I've never heard of any horse swimming the Brandywine. But what have horses to do with it? I will tell you later. Let's get indoors, and then we can talk. All right. Well, you and Pippin know your way. I will just ride on and tell Fatty Bulger that you're coming. Well, we'll see about supper and things. We had our supper early with Farmer Maggot, said Frodo. But we could do with another. Mm -hmm. You shall have it. Give me that basket, said Mary. And he rode ahead into the darkness. It was some distance from the Brandywine to Frodo's new house at Crick Hollow. They passed Buck Hill and Brandy Hall on their left. And on the outskirts of Buckleberry, they struck the main road of Buckland, which ran south from the bridge. Half a mile northward, along this, they came to a lane which opened to their right. This they followed for a couple of miles and climbed up and down into the country. At last, they came to a narrow gate in a thick hedge. Nothing could be seen of the house in the dark. It stood back from the lane in the middle of a wide circle of lawn, surrounded by a belt of low trees, inside the outer hedge. Frodo had chosen it because it stood in an out-of-way corner of the country, and there were no other dwellings close by. You could get in and out without being noticed. It had been built a long while before by the Brandy Bucks for the use of guests or members of the family that wished to escape from the crowded life of Brandy Hall for a time. It was an old-fashioned, countryfied house, as much like a hobbit hole as possible, it was long and low, with no upper story, and it had a roof of turf, round windows, and a large round door. As they walked up the green path from the gate, no light was visible. The windows were dark and shuttered. Frodo knocked at the door, and Fatty Bulger opened it. A friendly light streamed out. They slipped in quickly and shut themselves and the light inside. They were in a wide hall with doors on either side. In front of them, a passage ran back down the middle of the house. Well, what do you think of it? asked Mary, coming up the passage. We have done our best in a short time to make it look like home. After all, Fatty and I only got here with the last cartload yesterday. <coughs> Frodo looked around. It did look like home. Many of his own favorite things, or Bilbo's things, they reminded him sharply of him in their new setting were arranged as nearly as possible as they had been at Bag End. It was a pleasant, comfortable, welcoming place, and he found himself wishing that he really was coming here to settle down in quiet retirement. It seemed unfair to have put his friends to all this trouble, and he wondered again how he was going to break the news to them that he must leave them so soon, indeed at once. Yet that would have to be done that very night, before they all went to bed. It is delightful, he said with an effort. I hardly feel that I have moved at all. 
The travelers hung up their cloaks and piled their packs on the floor. Mary led them down the passage and threw open a door at the far end. Firelight came out and a puff of steam. A bath, cried Pippin. Oh, blessed Meriadoc! What order shall we go in, said Frodo? Eldest first or quickest first? You'll be the last either way, Master Peregrine. Trust me to arrange things better than that, said Mary. We can't, be lit. we can't begin our life at Crick Hollow with a quarrel over baths. In that room, there are three tubs and a copper full of boiling water. There's also towels, mats, and soap. Get inside. Be quick. Mary and Fatty went into the kitchen on the other side of the passage and busied themselves with the final preparations for a late supper. Snatches of competing songs came from the bathroom, mixed with a sound of splashing and wallowing. The voice of Pippin was suddenly lifted above the others in one of Bilbo's favorite bath songs. Sing hey for the bath that close of day and washes the weary mud away. A loon is he that will not sing. Oh, water hot, it's a noble thing. Oh, sweet is the sound of falling rain and the brook that leaps from hill to plain. But better than rain and rippling streams is water hot that smokes and steams. Oh, water cold, may we pour at need down a thirsty throat and be glad indeed. But better is beer if drink we lack and water hot pour down the back. Oh, water is fair that leaps on high in a fountain white beneath the sky. But never did a fountain sound so sweet as splashing hot water with my feet. And there was a terrific splash and a shout of whoa from Frodo. And it appeared that quite a lot of Pippin's bath had imitated a fountain and left on high. Mary went to the door. What about supper and beer in the throat? He called. Frodo came out, drying his hair. There's so much water in the air, I'm coming into the kitchen to finish, he said. Locks, said Mary, looking inside. The stone floor was swimming. You gotta mop all that up before you get anything to eat, Peregrine. Hurry up, or we shan't wait for you. They had supper in the kitchen on a table near the fire. Well, I suppose you three... Won't want mushrooms again, said Fredegar, without much hope. Yes, we shall, cried Pippin. They're mine, said Frodo, given to me by Mrs. Maggot, a queen amongst farmers' wives. Take your greedy hands away, and I'll serve them. Hobbits have a passion for mushrooms, surpassing even the greediest likings of big people, a fact that partly explains young Frodo's long expeditions into the renowned fields of the Marish and the wrath of the injured maggot. On this occasion, there was plenty for all, even according to Hobbit standards. There was also many other things to follow, and when they had finished, even Fatty Bulger heaved a sigh of content. They pushed back the table, and they drew their chairs around the fire. Well, clear up later, said Mary. Now tell me all about it. I guess that you've been having adventures, which was not quite fair without me. I want a full account. And most of all, I want to know what was the matter with old Maggot <coughs> and why he spoke to me like that. He sounded almost as if he was scared, if that's possible. We have all been scared, said Pippin, after a pause in which Frodo stared at the fire and did not speak. You would have been too. If you've been chased for two days by black riders, and what are they? Black figures riding black horses, answered Pippin. If Frodo won't talk, I'll tell you the whole tale from the beginning. And he then gave a full account of their journey from the time when they left Hobbiton. Sam gave various supporting nods and a few exclamations. Frodo remained silent. Well, I should think you're making it all up, said Mary. If I had not seen that black shape on the landing stage and heard that queer sound in Maggot's voice, what do you make of it all, Frodo? Cousin Frodo has been very close, said Pippin. But the time has come for him to open out. So far, we've been given nothing more to go on than Farmer Maggot's guess that it has something to do with old Bilbo's treasure. 
That was only a guess, said Frodo hastily. Maggot does not know anything. Well, old Maggot is a shrewd fellow, said Mary. A lot goes on behind that round face that does not come out in his talk. I have heard that he used to go into the old forest at one time, and he has the reputation for knowing a good many strange things. But you can at least tell us, Frodo, whether you think his guess is good or bad. I think, answered Frodo slowly, that it was a good guess as far as it goes. There is a connection with Bilbo's old adventures, and the writers are looking, or perhaps one ought to say searching, for him or for me. I also fear, if you want to know, that it is no joke at all, and that I am not safe here or anywhere else. He looked around at the windows and the walls as if he was afraid that they would suddenly give way. The others looked at him in silence and exchanged meaningful glances amongst themselves. It's coming out in a minute, whispered Perry. Uh, excuse me, Perry. Pippin to Mary. Mary nodded. Well, said Frodo at last, sitting up, straightening his back as if he had made a decision. I can't keep it dark any longer. I have got something to tell you all, but I don't know quite how to begin. I think I can help you, said Mary quietly, by telling you some of it myself. What do you mean, said Frodo, looking at him anxiously. Just this, my dear old Frodo, you are miserable because you don't know how to say goodbye. You mean to leave the Shire, of course, but danger has come upon you sooner than you expected. And now you're making up your mind to go at once, but you don't want to, and we are very sorry for you. Frodo opened his mouth and shut it again. His look of surprise was so comical that they all laughed. Dear old Frodo, said Pippin, did you really think that you had thrown dust in all of our eyes? You have not been nearly clever or careful enough for that. You have obviously been planning to go and saying farewell to all of your old haunts all this year since April. We have constantly heard you muttering, shall I ever look down into the valley again, I wonder, and things like that and pretending that you had come to the end of your money and actually selling your beloved bag end to those Sackville Bagginses and all those close talks with Gandalf. Good heavens, said Frodo. I thought I had been careful and clever. I don't know what Gandalf would say if all the Shire is discussing my departure then. Oh, no, said Mary. Don't worry about that. The secret won't keep for long, of course, but at present it is, I think, only known to us conspirators. After all, you must remember, we know you well and are often with you. We can usually guess what you are thinking. I knew Bilbo too. To tell you the truth, I've been watching you rather closely since he left. I thought you would go after him sooner or later. Indeed, I expected you to go sooner. And lately, we've been very anxious. We've been terrified that you might give us a slip and go off suddenly, all on your own like he did. Ever since this spring, we've kept our eyes open and done a good deal of planning on our own account. You are not going to escape so easily. But I must go, said Frodo. It cannot be helped. Dear friends, it is wretched for us all, but it is no use your trying to keep me. Since you have guessed so much, please help me. Do not hinder me. You do not understand, said Pippin. <coughs> you must go, and therefore... We must, too. Mary and I are coming with you. Sam is an excellent fellow and would jump down a dragon's throat to save you if he didn't trip over his own feet, but you will need more than one companion on your dangerous adventure. <laughs> My dear, most beloved hobbits, said Frodo, deeply moved. But I could not allow it. I decided that long ago, too. You speak of danger, but you do not understand. This is no treasure hunt, no there and back again journey. I am flying from deadly peril into deadly peril. Of course we understand, said Mary firmly. That is why we have decided to come. We know the ring is no laughing matter, but we are going to do our best to help you against the enemy. The ring, said Frodo, completely amazed. Yes, the ring, said Mary. My dear old hobbit, 
you don't allow for the inquisitiveness of friends. I have known about the existence of the ring for years, before Bilbo went away. In fact, but since he obviously regarded it as a secret, I kept the knowledge in my head until we formed our conspiracy. I did not know Bilbo, of course, as well as I know you. I was too young, and he would he was also more careful. But he was not careful enough. If you want to know how I first found out, I will tell you. Go on, said Frodo faintly. It was the Sackville Bagginsies that were his downfall, as you might expect. One day, a year before the party, I happened to be walking along the road when I saw Bilbo up ahead, and suddenly in the distance, the SBs appeared, coming towards us. Bilbo slowed down, and then, hey, presto, he vanished. I was so startled, I could hardly... I hardly had the wits to hide myself in a more ordinary fashion, but I got through the hedge and walked along the field inside, and I was peeping through into the road after the SBs had passed, looking straight at Bilbo when he suddenly reappeared. I caught a glint of gold as he put something back into his trouser pocket. After that, I kept my eyes open. In fact, I confess, I spied. But you must admit, it was very intriguing, and I was only in my teens. I must be the only one in the Shire besides you, Frodo, that has ever seen the old fellow's secret book. You have read his book, cried Frodo. Good heavens above, is nothing safe? Well, not too safe, I should say, said Mary. But I've only had one rapid glance. That was difficult to get. He never left the book about. I wonder what became of it. I should like another look. Have you got it, Frodo? No, and it was not at Bag End. He must have taken it away. Well, as I was saying, Mary proceeded, I kept my knowledge to myself until the spring when things got serious, and then we formed a conspiracy. And as we were serious too, and meant business, we have not been too scrupulous. You are not a very easy nut to crack, and Gandalf is worse. But if you want to be introduced to our chief investigator, then I shall produce him. Where is he? said Frodo, looking round as if he expected a masked sinister figure to leap out of a cupboard. Step forward, Sam, said Mary. And Sam stood up with a face scarlet up to his ears. Here's our collector of information. And he collected a lot, I can tell you, before he was finally caught. After which I may say he seemed to regard himself as on parole, and he dried right up. Sam! cried Frodo, feeling that his amazement could go no further, and quite unable to decide whether he felt angry, or amused, or relieved, or merely foolish. Yes, sir, said Sam, begging your pardon, sir, but I meant no wrong to you, Mr. Frodo, nor to Mr. Gandalf, for that matter. He has some sense, mind you. And when he said go alone, when you said go alone, he said no. Take someone as you can trust. But it does not seem that I can trust anyone, said Frodo. Sam looked at him unhappily. Well, it all depends on what you want. Mary put in. You can trust us to stick to you thick, through thick and thin, to the bitter end. And you can trust us to keep any secret of yours closer than you keep it yourself. But you cannot trust us to let you face trouble alone and go off without a word. We are your friends, Frodo. Anyway, there it is. We know most of what Gandalf has told you. We know a good deal about the ring. We are horribly afraid, but we are coming with you or following you like hounds. And after all, sir, said Sam, you did ought to take the elves' advice. Gildor said that you should take them as his will in, and you can't deny that. Well, I don't deny it, said Frodo, looking at Sam, who is now grinning. I don't deny it, but I'll never believe that you are sleeping again, whether you're snoring or not. I shall kick you hard to make sure. You are a set of deceitful scoundrels, he said, turning to the others. But bless you, he laughed, getting up and waving his arms. I give in. I will take Gildor's advice. If the danger were not so dark, I would dance for joy. Even so, I cannot help feeling happy. 
happier than I have felt in a long time, for I have dreaded this evening. Good, that's settled. Three cheers for Captain Frodo and the companions, they shouted, and then they danced around him. Merry and Pippin began a song, which they had apparently got ready for the occasion. It was made on the model of the dwarf song that started Bilbo on his adventure long ago and went to the same tune. Farewell, we call to hearth and hall, through wind may blow and rain may fall. We must away ere break of day, for over wood and mountain tall, to Rivendell where elves yet dwell, in glades beneath the misty fell. Through moor and waste we ride in haste, to whither then we cannot tell. With foes ahead behind us dread, beneath the sky shall be our bed, until at last our toil be past, our journey done, our errand sped. We must away, we must away, we ride before the break of day. Very good, said Frodo. But in that case, there's a lot of things to do before we go to bed, under a roof for tonight, at any rate. Oh, that was poetry, said Pippin. Did you really mean to start before the break of day? Well, I don't know, answered Frodo. I fear those black riders, and I am sure it is unsafe to stay in one place long, especially in a place to which it was known I was going. Also, Gildor advised me to not wait, but I should very much like to see Gandalf. I could see that even Gildor was disturbed when he heard that Gandalf had never appeared. It really depends on two things. How soon could the riders get to Buckleberry, and how soon can we get off? It will take a good deal of preparation. In answer to the second question, said Mary, we can get off in about an hour. I have prepared practically everything. There are five ponies in a stable across the field. Stores and tack are all packed, except for a few extra clothes and our perishable food. <laughs> it seems you've been a very efficient conspiracy, said Frodo. But what about the Black Riders? Would it be safe to wait one day for Gandalf? Well, that all depends on what you think the Riders would do if they found you here, answered Mary. They could have reached here by now, of course, if they had not stopped at the North Gate, where the hedge runs down by the riverbank, just this side of the bridge. The gate guards will not let them through by night, though they might break through. Even in the daylight, they would try to keep them out, I think, at any rate, until they got a message through to the master of the hall, for they will not like the look of these riders, and would certainly be frightened by them. But of course, Buckland cannot resist a determined attack for long, and it is possible that in the morning, even a black rider that rode up and asked for Mr. Baggins would be let through. It is pretty generally known that you are coming to live at Crick Hollow. Frodo sat for a while and thought, I have made up my mind, he said finally. I am starting tomorrow, as soon as it is light. But I am not going by road. It would be safer to wait here than that. If I go through the north gate, my departure from Buckland will be known at once, instead of being secret for several days at least, as it might be. And what is more, the bridge and the east road near the border will certainly be watched, whether any rider gets to Buckland or not. We don't know how many there are, but there are at least two, and possibly more. The only thing to do is to go off in a quite unexpected direction. But that could only mean going to the old forest, said Fredegar, horrified. You can't be think of doing that. It's quite as dangerous as black riders. Not quite, said Mary. It sounds very desperate, but I believe Frodo is right. It is the only way of getting off without being followed at once. With luck, we might get a considerable start. But you won't have any luck in the old forest, objected Fredegar. No one ever has any luck in there. You'll all get lost. People don't go in there. Oh, yes, they do, said Mary. The brandy bucks go in. Occasionally, when a fit takes them, we have a private entrance. Frodo went in once long ago, and I've been in several times. But usually in daylight, of course when the trees are sleepy and fairly quiet. Well, do you th do as you think best, said Fredegar. <coughs> I am more afraid of the old forest than of anything I know about. 
The stories about it are a nightmare. But my vote hardly counts, as I am not going on the journey. Still, I am very glad someone is stopping behind. Who can tell Gandalf what you've done when he turns up, as I'm sure he will before long. Fond as he was of Frodo, Fatty Bolger had no desire to leave the Shire, nor to see anything that lay outside it. His family came from the East Farthing, from Budgeford and the Bridgefields, in fact. But he had never been over the Brandywine Bridge. His task, according to the original plan of the conspirators, was to stay behind and deal with inquisitive folk, and to keep up, as long as possible, the pretense that Mr. Baggins was still living at Crick Hollow. He had even brought along some old clothes of Frodo's to help him in playing the part. They little thought how dangerous that part might prove to be. Excellent, said Frodo when he understood the plan. We could not have left any message behind for Gandalf otherwise. I don't know whether these writers can read or not, of course, but I should not have dared to risk a written message in case they got in and searched the house. But if Fatty is willing to hold the fort, and I can be sure of Gandalf knowing the way that we have gone, that decides me. I'm going into the old forest first thing tomorrow. Well, that's that, said Pippin. On the whole, I would rather have our job than Fatty's. Waiting here until black riders come. You'll, you wait till you're well inside the forest, said Fredegar. You'll wish you were back here with me before this time tomorrow. Well, it's no good arguing about it anymore, said Mary. We have still got to tidy up and put the finishing touches on the packing before we get to bed. I shall call you all before the break of day. When at last he had got to bed, Frodo could not sleep for some time. His legs ached. He was glad that he was riding in the morning. Eventually, he fell into a vague dream in which he seemed to be looking out of a high window over a dark sea of tangled trees. Down below, among the roots, there was a sound of creatures crawling and snuffling. He felt sure that they were going to smell him out sooner or later. Then he heard a noise in the distance. At first, he thought it was a great wind coming over the leaves of the forest, and then he knew it was not leaves. It was the sound of the sea. Far off, a sound he had never heard in his waking life, though it had often troubled his dreams. Suddenly, he found he was out in the open. There were no trees after all. He was on a dark heath, and there was a strange salt smell in the air. Looking up, he saw before him a tall white tower standing alone on a high ridge, and a great desire came over him to climb that tower and see the sea. He started to struggle up the ridge towards the tower, but suddenly a light came into the sky, and there was a noise of thunder. And that is the end of chapter five. A noise of thunder? Quite a bit shorter than the other chapters. Judah is laying down. Probably can't manage to listen to another chapter. The next chapter is quite involved and has a great number of songs. What do you think? Should we do chapter six as well? No. An old song kind of uh, Sick. kind oh, of uh, <laughs> Well, we only read for 34 minutes instead of for an hour tonight. It is 